Hello, and welcome to today's webcast. I'm Lisa Ward, Director of Education for Maddie's Fund. Our topic today is one that we've been asked a lot about, and we're delighted to welcome Dr. Lena Dattar, who has a great deal of experience treating shelter dogs, cats, and exotic pets. Dr. Dattar is currently Assistant Clinical Professor at Cornell University College of Veterinary Medicine, where she specializes in infectious disease management and prevention population management and metrics, elective and non-elective surgery, humane husbandry, and shelter design and shelter medicine instruction. She's also involved in research projects investigating the epidemiology of infectious shelter disease, shelter medicine teaching, and high volume, high quality surgery. Today she comes with some very practical information about caring for exotic pets in the shelter. Welcome, Dr. Dattar, and take it away. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here this afternoon. I'm talking to you from beautiful Ithaca, New York. Um, and today we're going to talk about something that is um, one of my favorite things in the shelter, which is the opportunity that I have to hang out with the exotic pets. Um, and by exotic pets, just to give you guys a bit of an um, introduction, I, what I mean by that is the companion animals that we see in the shelter that are not dogs or cats. So anything that comes in that somebody had as a pet at some point, but isn't a dog and cat, that's what we're talking about here. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to just sort of um, say first of all is that this is an extremely broad topic. And I could probably give you a 60 minute lecture on sheltering rabbits in the shelter or sheltering snakes in the shelter, but I am going to attempt to sort of go over all of the very more fundamental processes of how to approach these animals because they come in in such different numbers and different varieties. And it's good to have a plan, even if you don't know what it is that's coming in. So this is important because um, it happens so often. And sometimes it happens that we mistake an animal that happens to be a wild animal for a companion animal, and then we have to figure out what to do with it. And sometimes it's because all of a sudden, those of us who work in shelters are faced with the intake of an animal or several of them, and we have to figure out suddenly what to do with that. And so this is just a clip from May 15th, 2019, which is the last time I gave this lecture to my students here at Cornell. Um, and that morning I was Googling for news articles about companion animals and shelters, and I got these two stories back to back, and I was like, this is perfect. This is exactly why this is an important topic. So the first question um, we always have about animals coming into the shelter is, why are they even here? What are they doing? Um, and um, just sort of a preview, we're going to talk about enrichment for rabbits in a little bit, but also this topic is very much enrichment for me. So. Um, that's why this slide is here as a reminder. So they come into the shelter and if they come in with an owner, it can be very nice because they have a lot of information about that pet and what that pet might be like medically and behaviorally. And so it's up to us to collect all of that information as much as we can when the owner surrenders them. And these can be managed surrenders or they can be sudden surrenders, but with that owner there, they are a real resource. And just to remember that even though they leave the animal there and disappear um, down that away through the door away from your shelter, if they leave contact information and you have questions later, I would encourage you to call them because they might still be available to answer your questions. But sometimes you don't have that opportunity. Sometimes the owner died and now you have this animal which it, you know has a lifespan of 100 years as well and they may have gotten the animal in middle age and now you're stuck with it and they may not, may not have had the information that you wanted about all of the things, like the medical and behavioral history. Sometimes you get animals on transport, so this is more of a modern sheltering technique, um, especially, for example, in the case of uh, receiving 47 cockatiels. Here in Ithaca, um, which is a small little town, we could not um, adopt out 47 cockatiels to, the, to members of the, the citizenry here in Ithaca. But if I sent a bunch of them over to Rochester, if I sent some of them up to um, Buffalo, if I sent some down to the city, we could certainly find homes for 47 cockatiels. And so this can be a nice tool for you. Um, and then hopefully if you receive these animals, you would also receive some information about why, where they came from and what was going on with them. 
I have also been very surprised at the types of animals that we have coming in stray to the shelter. I have seen stray lovebirds. I have seen stray cockatiels, stray budgies, stray rabbits, stray turtles, stray boa constrictors. Um, and people find them and recognize that this is not an animal that belongs here. And especially if members of the public are able to approach them and pick them up, they're probably a companion animal and they probably would like to be in a home and not outside. And so then we can find shelter for them in the shelter. We can find an adopter for them, hopefully, and take care of them, do what they need. But in that situation, you don't have a lot of information. And so you're kind of stuck um, the same way we are with a dog or a cat on trying to figure out all these things sort of from scratch. And then, um, just like dogs and cats, you can get these animals coming into your shelters uh, from cruelty and, and humane investigations. And so, this may, um, and it seems to with these exotic animals in particular, um, involve a large number of different species um, and may involve thousands of animals at a time. And that can be rather overwhelming for any shelter, even the very large ones. So, the first task that you have when you have an exotic animal come into the shelter is what is this? And so I'm gonna do a little, test this out, see how this works, a little pulse poll here. So can you do a thumbs up for me if you have ever had an animal come into the shelter that you didn't exactly recognize? Like you maybe understood that it was a turtle or at least it was either a turtle or a tortoise, but you had to look up and figure out what species it might have been. So please click on the green arrow if you have, or green thumb if you have, and click on the red thumb if you have not. Thank you very much for answering. And the vast majority of you all picked, yes, I have had an animal come into the shelter that I did not recognize right away. And I'm glad because it makes me feel a little bit less dumb about this sort of thing. This is one that came into my shelter um, when I was working in Arizona. It's a sulcata tortoise, and we got 21 of them in on a cruelty investigation. And all of a sudden, I had to figure out what they were, what they needed, um, how to take care of them, how to tell if they were sick, and how to um, even really look at them. As you can see, they are rather large. Uh, the larger ones that come in were um, about 120 pounds. And so um, that was a bit of a, a challenge as you can imagine, but we managed to do it. And um, I think that they ended up getting adopted, pretty much all of them. There was one that we ended up having to euthanize because she was so far gone. And I think it was very successful intervention for the most part. So identifying the species is very important um, because species differences, as you probably know, are very different than breed differences. The breed differences, everybody is the same species. They just or might be bigger or smaller, like a chihuahua or a Great Dane. But with turtles or tortoises, for example, a box turtle that maxes out at 10 pounds and about 20 centimeters across is going to have very different needs than a sulcata tortoise that's used to roaming the savannas of Africa. And so knowing that species can help you then figure out what all of these things are that we're gonna talk about going forward from here. Also, as a reminder, sometimes different genders of the same species can look very different, especially with birds. So um, always worth sort of Googling for information. And really, I think Google is a fantastic tool. Um, also, having friends that know a lot about these things, if you can text them pictures, that's very, very helpful. And then even just giving a really thorough description of the animal as it comes in, um, whether it's from a cruelty case or from a stray, um, situation. And then if somebody calls and says, hey, I'm looking for this tortoise, and it's uh, this kind of tortoise, you can Google it and match the picture to the animal that came into your shelter. And then um, we'll talk about care and husbandry sheets here in just a second. So the next step then, once you've identified the species, is to identify what kind of a thing it is, what kind of a uh, tortoise or what kind of a mammal so for example, this sugar glider here, um, I might have figured out that it's a sugar glider, but I might want to know, is it a male sugar glider or is it a female sugar glider? And if I turn it over and I find this, you know, sort of slit in its abdomen, what does that mean? So those of you who know sugar gliders, you can hold on to your answers and I'll explain in just a minute and the rest of you can stare at it and ponder for just a second. 
So the first thing you want to do, like I said, is try to identify the individual. So if you can scan for a microchip, that's very good. Um, and then advertise on your social media for finding this animal if it's stray. Um, probably not if it's a seizure. Try to identify the gender if you don't know. Um, it can be very hard to do these things if you didn't know, for example, that a sugar glider is a marsupial, for example. There you go. It's a female. She has a pouch. Um, some species, especially bird species, the only way you're going to know is by using an endoscope or DNA typing, and so I don't recommend doing that right away. Um, and mammals in particular, you might want to separate male and female, but if they're spayed or neutered, that may not be necessary. Um, and it also can be very difficult uh, to tell whether they may be pregnant or not, which is another question. Uh, life stage is also nice to know if you can figure it out. So are they adult or are they a juvenile? Um, on birds, if they are stray and they have a leg band or um, some sort of uh, little tag that they put around their foot, a lot of times that will have a year on it. And that year will specify to you when they were born. And then you can sort of extrapolate what their age might be. Um, if you have an animal that is very ill or has a serious medical condition, it may be difficult to tell whether they're young or old because they may be extra small, they may not look right, they may not act right. And then when you give them good husbandry and they improve, then you might be able to tell later. So these kinds of things can be a little fluid. And then some animals uh, come in and they might be bonded, like truly bonded pairs. And that can happen with rabbits and birds. Um, others, not so much. So if you have a lot of times reptiles that come in, they might have lived in the same cage forever. It's pretty rare that they would be bonded in the same way that a bird would be bonded. And it, sometimes, especially with birds, they may not be bonded to their own, um, a member of their own species. So they may have cross species bonding and that's something else to consider. Um, if you want to house animals together and they're from different places, it's just like with dogs and cats, unless you know their medical history and their vaccination status and their disease status, you may want a couple weeks or some length of um, quarantine before putting them together. And I don't mean keeping them away from the adoption floor, I just mean not housing them together until you have a better idea of their health. So now that you know what you have and what kind of thing that you have, you can do some pathway planning, just like we do with dogs and cats. And some things don't change with species. So you still need to give everybody a unique ID number, and I mean everybody, including every single little goldfish that is in that tank needs their own ID number, so that when you adopt out one goldfish, you know more or less which one it was that went. They also need a computer record, if you have a computer system. It can be very nice to have a photograph of every one of them, especially in cruelty cases, having photographs is very good evidence um, and good evidence practice. You want to do a intake examination. At minimum, this should be a visual examination without getting bit. Um, at the most invasive, it can be uh, just like a dog or cat. For example, with these ferrets, you could do a full physical exam, including looking at their teeth, looking in their eyes, looking in their ears, giving them vaccinations, everything like that. They need to have a specific location in the shelter that they will be housed. And we'll talk about what they need for that location, but this should be known in advance or at least have some sort of good idea or a flex space that can be used for this. There should be a plan for their ongoing care if they need it um, in terms of medical or behavioral care, but also in terms of their husbandry. And they need to have a plan for their outcome, which is obviously very challenging in situations where you have cruelty cases and you don't necessarily have custody of those animals. But if you do have an owner surrender, the plan should be default to adoption. And then if that can't happen because of medical or behavioral concerns, then the plan should be evaluate and euthanize as soon as it makes sense to do so. Some animals that come in that are exotic pets need things in the shelter before they can go up to adoption that may be different than others. And so we would expect um, for uh, well-resourced shelters that rabbits get spayed and neutered before they be become adopted out. Um, sometimes that can happen before they leave. Sometimes that can happen on a voucher system. Um, or if they're super young, especially with the does, it can be very difficult to do that surgery before they're four months old. And so you might give them a voucher if you adopt out an eight-week-old rabbit and say, okay, great, come back in two months and we will do the surgery for you at that time. 
as much as possible, I would recommend microchipping everything. Um, the sulcata tortoises, we had a big debate about um, and ended up not microchipping them uh, because it was very difficult and we didn't have anybody that was very good with reptile medicine on staff at that point in time. Um, but um, I, in general, especially if you are having a ferret or a rabbit or an animal that you expect that might get loose again, those are the animals I would focus on for microchipping, but not necessarily everyone. Ferrets uh, should be vaccinated upon entry to the shelter. And remember not to use the canine vaccines for December for ferrets. Um, they will die uh, from the vaccines. Uh, they have ferret-specific vaccinations for December, and they should also be vaccinated for rabies. And then if you see fleas, that may be the indication to treat for fleas. If you see mites, maybe that's your indication. But you might also have a policy in your shelter that every animal of a particular species comes in, they might just always get treated with revolution on intake. And that's part of your protocol. Husbandry considerations are going to differ by species. Um, and that, that's sort of the take home message of this lecture because I will go on and on about it, and that's what that is. But um, those will differ by individual and species. And then enrichment will also differ. So um, I have a, a strange cat in my house that likes to chase things um, and bring them back to you just like a dog. But most people's cats don't really care about that sort of thing. Um, in particular, looking at the animal, try to enrich them in the way that best suits their own personalities, their own stage in life, and their own species. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, too. So and like I said, I'm going to dwell a lot on husbandry protocols. And the reason is that these really are what um, the make or break your ability to take care of exotic pets in the shelter. And that's why I keep coming back to them. This is a, a bunch of koi that are being taken care of at Best Friends in Utah. So a protocol is a set of guidelines. And I'm sure you guys all know about protocols because you probably live and breathe them every single day. But it help, they are designed, these in particular, to help care staff follow the veterinary directions and husbandry guidelines without somebody standing over their shoulder and telling them what to do. Um, and it's very nice so that if it's three o'clock in the morning and suddenly there's a snake in your shelter, this person who takes that snake in will know what to do. It may be as simple, your protocol could be as simple as don't open the container and call the herpetological society. For many shelters, this is their protocol for taking reptiles in, and that's fine. Um, it's very helpful for that protocol to also list a member of the herpetological society so that they can, uh, the staff member can do that very well. Um, the husband breed protocol should also specify what kind of cage they're supposed to go into, where in the shelter they're supposed to go, um, what kind of food they need, um, and we'll get into all of that in a, just a little bit. Uh, but these protocols can uh, take a fair amount of effort to make. And so what we recommend doing is prioritizing the animals and the types of care that are the most commonly seen in your shelter. And I will show you how to do that in just a second. Information sheets can be extremely helpful for designing protocols, or maybe you want to make your own as part of a husbandry protocol. These are available online um, from the uh, Avian Welfare Coalition from uh, Banfield, actually has a large one on their reptiles. And this one is uh, from lefebervet.com. And for the veterinarians out there that are a little bit nervous about treating exotic pets, I would definitely recommend signing up for lefebervet.com, uh, become a member. It's free as a veterinarian, and you can have access to all of these information sheets for a host of very, very interesting species, including hedgehogs. Which species are most commonly seen in your shelter? Look at this list for just a second. See if you can formulate in your own head the answer to that question. Which one is the most commonly seen? Which one maybe have you never seen? And then I'll show you my experience here. So Oregon Humane in 2014, um, which is the year that I happen to have a complete data set of all the animals that came into that shelter that year for other reasons. Um, took in 10.3% of their intakes were exotic pets. They had rabbits as the number one, so they took in 312 rabbits out of a roughly 11,000 intake and um, 222 rats. 
guinea pigs, rodents, birds, reptiles. That was what they did there. This year, a year to date for Tompkins County, which is the shelter that I am currently stationed at, 9.6% um, of the total intake that we have done so far, and guinea pigs managed to beat rabbits out. Um, it doesn't it seem surprising to me because I feel like I have been uh, doing surgery on rabbits like crazy, but um, the guinea pigs did manage to beat them out at 46. Um, we had 20 rats, we had six birds, um, and then other rodents and a bearded dragon. I will also point out, this is one of my favorite pictures of birds because it is the smallest companion bird and the largest companion bird hanging out together. Uh, the top one is a parallel, and the bottom one is a hyacinth macaw. So um, you could probably guess from this picture, this is more of a lesson in what not to do than what to do um, for the primary enclosure. And this is one of the things that can be challenging in the shelter if you don't have equipment on hand. Um, cage materials are important. So for example, if you put a rodent, especially a rat or a mouse in a plastic cage, they may just chew their way out of the cage. Um, you might want to put them in a glass aquarium and that can look very nice, but um, they may have large amounts of ammonia if they're not cleaned very, very frequently. The cage shape needs to be appropriate for the animal. For example, a finch likes to fly side to side. And so they would probably benefit more from a long, low cage versus a parrot, which is actually a climbing bird, and they like to climb up and down. And so they would like to have a tall cage, not necessarily that wide. Like every shelter medicine person out there, I'm a huge fan of portals for cats. I also like them for chihuahuas, and I love them for rabbits and ferrets. They really like the primary enclosures that have a space where they can have their toilet and space where they can have their food. And I have very much seen rabbits succeeding and for it succeeding in the shelter when they are put into portaled cages. Maybe you have an entire room system for your animal, so one pet per room, and that can be very nice for a host of different animals. Um, snakes, maybe not so much. People seem to be kind of freaked out about snakes more when they're on the floor and not in something contained, just as an FYI. The substrate that you put in the primary closure is important, so thinking about that, um, aromatic hardwoods in general can be problematic for a number of different species. Um, reptiles, if they get um, a live mouse food and the live mouse has a chip of pine shaving or something like on that, they can actually swallow the pine shaving in addition to the mouse. They can't digest it, and so it can actually um, cause some enteritis and serious problems. Um, birds, not a good idea because of the uh, aromatics that they give out. And then like dogs and cats, you don't want to put graded floors underneath the animals without something in between, whether it's a towel or lots and lots of paper or something like that. Heat, humidity, and water are incredibly important for our reptile and amphibian friends, obviously fish with their water quality. Um, I, it's way beyond the bounds of this lecture to give you guys all of the preferred optimal temperature zones for all of these animals. And so I would highly recommend figuring out which ones that you see most commonly, and then looking those up in particular. And then everybody should have some sort of comfortable resting and hiding space. A, a lot of the animals that are companion exotic pets are prey species. And so the prey species should all have a hiding spot that they can hide themselves from the view of anybody walking by. And then the predator species, maybe not quite as much, but even they like to have little places to hide. I'm thinking about ferrets and the ferret pockets that you can get and how much they love resting in there. So if you can figure out what's wrong with this picture, first of all, you can't see this, but there are barking dogs all over the place. There are feral cats hiding in these two kennels. I don't know if you can see them behind the litter, hiding behind their litter boxes. We've got a wire floor here, and this poor rabbit is basically entire kennel floor space is taken up by a litter box and then a bowl of food and some water. Hopefully that rabbit knows how to drink out of a bowl because not all of them do. Some of them expect to get a water bottle. So this is one of those times when I said, oh, wow, um, I would just like to steal that rabbit and, and never take it back. Doesn't have any hay, doesn't have a hiding place, doesn't have enough space, poor thing. So in contrast, here is a boa constrictor and um, boa constrictor, like pythons, they can generally have very nice cages um, if you set them up with a place to hide, some water, um, some logs to climb around, and then a place for them to um, get away from you if they want to. 
This is a red-tailed boa. So the next thing, um, once we've tackled the primary enclosure and you've figured out all of that stuff for your husbandry protocol, the next thing is husbandry consideration. So I'm going to do a pulse again. So the pulse question this time is, please click the green thumbs up if you have ever had an animal come into your shelter and then had to go to the grocery store because they just came in and you didn't have what you needed to feed them. Excellent. Okay, so every single one of you that answered, answered thumbs up. And that's great. That means that you understand that there are things that you can provide in your shelter for these animals, and sometimes you just need to get a little bit more creative. Um, it's probably not a good idea to stock your fridge with all of the things that you might need to feed these exotic animals if you don't know that they're coming in. But, of course, if you do know they're coming in, if you have the managed admissions process, you can go shopping beforehand. All right. So. Now that we've gone to the grocery store, we can feed our bearded dragon that just came into the shelter. And remember, diet is species specific. So this is something that you would want to have listed out on your species husbandry sheet. Um, and in general, there are some considerations that um, if you want to feed the very best nutrition to your birds and reptiles and rodents, a pelleted diet may be a better idea than a seed diet. Um, that's because the pellets often are homogenized and have all of the nutrients they need, and it's harder to pick through them and only pick out the very best fatty, tasty bits and leave all the rest of the healthy things behind. That said, there are some birds that will not eat the pellets, and so it might just be sort of a transitionary thing that you mention um, to owners that they, they do this after adoption. Um, so this birded dragon, he is an omnivore, and so he wants to eat all sorts of things. A lot of times they will be given alfalfa in the shelter, but they also like cactuses. They also like acorn squash and bananas and mealworms and crickets and dandelions and pinkies. Um, all of these things would be appropriate and nice to feed to a bearded dragon um, in different sort of proportions, but um, this little guy would be happy to eat any of those things. And I would definitely have to make a grocery run right now if one of these things came into my care. So diet, again, related to species. Cleaning, um, maybe a little bit more general. So reptiles, birds, and small mammals, all, all three groups can be very sensitive to cleaners that don't seem to bother dogs and cats as much. Maybe it's because they can't get away from the fumes quite as much. We do tend to keep them in smaller cages. Um, or because, like, rep, like some reptiles and all birds, their respiratory tracts are very, very sensitive to these things. And so high concentrations of bleach, for example, are really not very good for any one of these creatures. Not that they're really great for us either, but just something to keep in mind. Um, and then uh, obviously species specific things like Teflon and birds, don't keep your birds in the kitchen, that sort of thing. And which also leads to, you know, when we think of cleaning, we're not just cleaning the cage itself, but we're also often cleaning in the macro environment. Um, lower concentrations of bleach to clean the hallways around the kennels of these species is probably okay, um, but housing predators and prey species together is not okay. So it would be okay if I house a bearded dragon with a, a boa constrictor, because they're both well, omnivorous and, and sort of predatory, but I would definitely not want to house a rabbit and a snake in the same room, for example. Um, and that's um, mentioned in the ASC guidelines. Um, loud noises uh, can be very frightening to a lot of these prey species. Uh, they survive in the wild because they're afraid of things and they hide when they hear loud noises and um, large rustlings in the bushes. Um, but there are some birds that really get frustrated then when it's too quiet. And so um, having a little bit of music playing or a little bit of chatter or even cell phones going off ringing can really inspire some birds to sing and, and show their, um, their true colors. Light cycles are important. Uh, it's great if you can maintain sort of a daily um, cycle of, of dark in the nighttime and light in the daytime. And then heat cycles are also important, especially for reptiles where there might be times of day when it's better that they're colder and times of day when it's better that they're warmer and offering them a range of heats within their cage can help them optimize that as well. Enrichment is, um, I think, a very essential part of husbandry. It's kind of what we live for when we are um, 
just waiting for something to happen. And that's what a lot of these animals are doing is waiting for something to happen. Maybe it's the next meal, maybe it's to be adopted, although they don't often know that that's in their future. But providing enrichment for all of these animals should be a part of your uh, husbandry sheet. The other nice thing about enrichment is that it can be extremely variable and it can be very inexpensive and it can be quite enriching for the humans that are caring for these animals to provide. Um, in the avian book that I have as a resource here, they talk about different types of enrichment and they list out sensory and manipulatory, meaning touching things, and environmental, um, so that would be more like music, foraging, feeding, so like puzzle toys, social enrichment, so hanging out with other members of the species or other species, and training. Um, so all of these different types can be used to enrich the animals that you are caring for, whether it's dogs or cats or mice or snakes. And so for small rodents, they really would like puzzle toys um, that have food in them or climbing obstacles. As you can see, these rats are playing on a, a sisal rope. For snakes, actually pegboards are really great enrichment. You can um, get, make these yourself if you have a lot of large snakes in your care. Um, you might even make one and send it with the reptile when it goes home. Um, they just climb on them and, and twist themselves into all sorts of interesting shapes. And um, if you want, they can be a great marketing technique or sort of advertisement in your window when they do that. Um, birds, especially the large birds, they might get a lot of enrichment out of you handing, handing them a whole nut that they have to peel. Not peanuts, because peanuts are not very good for birds, but um, if you hand them a whole walnut with the case on, it might take them a very long time to get into that case to get to the nut, and that's a great brain work for them. Water spray is great for birds too. A lot of the birds in the parrot family really thrive when you give them a water bath. Not all birds have been trained to do this and it might be rather surprising to them the first time you try, so go slowly. And then target training is, with parrots especially can be very nice if you have to do things like nail trims or beak trims or moving them from one cage to another. It's a really great hands-off way of training them to move around so that your staff that may not be that bird savvy can handle them. Uh, note here, don't use a pen for target training because they will just eat the pens and then get ink everywhere and it's probably not good for them to eat the ink. Um, I might have had a personal experience with that. So these are all pictures that I took off of Facebook of various friends and relations um, animals that they are taking care of. Uh, some of these are from shelter vets and some of these are just from my friends. This is my little cousin Tessa who's reading, reading to her dragon. Dragonessa, um, and that can be enrichment for the dragon, and it also can be enrichment for Tessa there. Um, but the reason I have this slide here is to remind me to talk about the fact that most of these animals will live in a primary enclosure, which is very similar to their shelter enclosure, in their new home, and thrive in that enclosure. And that is potentially very nice for us because this can be something that as shelters, we can really succeed with. This is the expectation these animals will stay in these primary enclosures. If we make these primary enclosures as nice and large and enriched as possible, that's a great way to set the animals up for success and also to set them up for success in their adoptive home. So before we let them out of the shelter, we talk about um, ways that they leave. This is kind of more aimed at the veterinarians in the audience, but the LVTs and everybody else should also know that these things exist. Um, we talk a little bit about the medical conditions that I encounter in these species when they come into the shelter. And there are obviously far too many conditions to go into, so if you are creating protocols for these species in particular, especially you veterinarians, you should decide which protocols are worth the time that you would be spending on them based on what's most commonly seen the same way that the managers should be creating husbandry treats based on the animals that are the most commonly seen. So these are sort of my top 10. This is not um, meant to sort of influence other people's lists of things that they see, but this is what I have. So number one are husbandry issues. And yes, this is tied back into the whole theme of the lecture. So husbandry issues can include things like skin disease, feather disease, eye problems, tooth problems, not getting the right type of diet, body condition, and then dietary problems. And the nice thing about husbandry issues 
is if they're not that bad, or if you can address them in sort of a, a reasonably simple way, merely taking care of the animal in a well, um, a well prescribed way according to your protocol will resolve these problems. That's not always the case with all medical problems, but a lot of the animals that I see come in with um, uh, pododermatitis, for example, and it's because they have been standing in urine and feces encrusted litter on the bottoms of their cages for a long time. And then when they aren't standing in that for a couple of weeks, all of a sudden they are cured and I don't have to do a lot about it. And that's really nice. I can make the animals that come into my shelter um, better off. External parasites we see rather frequently, like these ear mites in this rabbit. Um, rabbit ear mites are amazing. Uh, they it can, are not that difficult to treat and are extremely rewarding and um, very nice to, and fun to show people under the microscope. Pododermatitis, as I mentioned, and that's not just rabbits and guinea pigs, but birds also suffer um, very acutely from pododermatitis if they don't have the right things to stand on. Oral disease, and I mean that in terms of teeth, but I also mean that in terms of beaks and in terms of uh, teeth when it comes to reptiles as well. Um, we also see dental fractures, especially in other carnivores like ferrets. Fractures are really common. We see fractured legs like the bunny in that Facebook picture in the last slide, but we also see um, fractured wings like um, Uncle Fester here, the parakeet. Um, and then turtles, of course, will wander out in the middle of the road and get run over and they can um, have their carapaces fractured and those can be challenging to deal with as well. Other conditions I see fairly frequently, um, respiratory disease. So this is a radiograph that I took of a um, rat that had pneumonia. And I used a dental machine to take this x-ray because the rat was super tiny. Um, and then this is a picture of a hamster necropsy, not a rat, but it's, it has a similar disease there. Uh, birds and reptiles can also have respiratory disease. Sometimes this is related to aromatics in their kennels in their primary enclosures, and sometimes it's related to infectious diseases, some of which are rather important. GI parasites are also rather important to a lot of these, especially mammals. Um, rabbits in particular get GI stasis. They can also have coccidia that lives in their liver, um, proliferatory bowel disease in birds, and wet tail in hamsters, and then of course psittacosis, which I have on both respiratory and GI disease for birds because it causes symptoms in both of those systems. Reproductive disease we see very commonly. Um, dystocia, for example, um, or maybe egg binding or um, neoplasia, so it spans all of the different species. Rabbits in particular are very prone to uterine cancer. And then metabolic and endocrine diseases, I would say ferrets are more of the poster child for these ones with their insulinomas and their adrenal disease. But we also get mineral deficiencies, which are somewhat of a metabolic disease in a lot of different species. And then neoplasia also, although I kind of listed that under repro. But a lot of animal species, especially when they're older, can get cancer. And it can be a lot of different types depending on the species. And knowing the species can help you understand which cancer is the most likely for those animals. So that's just sort of my experience of what I see for animals coming in. When I don't know what's going on, um, I turn to the textbooks, I turn to VIN, I turn to lafebre.com, and I start calling around for help and try to figure out what it is that's going on. And if I can't figure it out, or if it's something that I've diagnosed but I can't do anything about because I don't have the right equipment, I don't have any um, qualms about referring these animals to other people in my community who know how to do these things better than I do. Spay neuter, just rabbits mostly. Um, just a few things about this. So rabbits are difficult to intubate and most shelters use a mask or have rabbits on injectable only anesthesia. There is a higher anesthetic risk for rabbits, so we recommend using multimodal protocols, so smaller doses of more different types of drugs. The tissue is friable, so it can be very difficult to shave them, um, and uh, their tissues are friable in surgery. They have very vascular broad ligaments, unlike dogs and cats, and they need to be ligated during surgery. 
Their testicles are super long and soft and squishy, and it can be hard sometimes to make sure that you've actually taken the whole thing because they sort of merge into this traumatic cord. And then, as I mentioned before, uterine cancer is very common. We want to make sure that we get very good post-op pain control because if they're super painful, that can predispose them to GI stasis. Also, fun fact, rabbits, female rabbits are always in heat. They don't ever come out of heat. So you wouldn't have to worry about whether or not the rabbit's in heat um, as a timing question for surgery because they always are. But all of this is manageable, and a lot of shelters are very successful at spaying and neutering their rabbits. So outcomes for exotic animals. So we did intakes at the beginning of the lecture, and now we'll talk about outcomes. So it's very nice if at the beginning, at intake, you can have a plan for the pathway of this animal through your shelter. And if they have a owner surrender or a stray, um, and they've been through their stray hold intake, then it can be very easy. It becomes a lot more complicated when you have an investigation, as I mentioned. Adoption is obviously the ideal for all of these animals. This is what we want for them. This is why we do what we do. But sometimes we have to figure something else out. And so wildlife, birds, and farm animals in particular, there may be a sanctuary option for them. And that is unlike a lot of the dog and cat placements that we think about. Um, there are particular rescue organizations that specialize in herpetology specimens and birds. Um, so reptiles, amphibians, um, sometimes it's individuals that have collections that they manage somewhat like a private zoo. It's always a good idea to go visit before you, you know, place one of these animals in one of these rescues if you can. Um, or just look online and see what their reputation looks like. Talk to other shelters that have worked with them before. If you're overwhelmed by the number of animals that you have of a certain type, transport to other shelters can be very helpful. Um, or if you have an animal that you're not supposed to be taking care of, like wildlife, then sending them over to a rehabilitation center is very much the best thing for them. Unless they're not injured and they're a local species and you don't know why somebody brought them and you know where they came from, and then sometimes it might be okay to just drive over there and let them out of your car. Euthanasia should always be considered for animals that have serious medical, behavioral conditions. There are animals that have legal statuses that are different for um, exotic pets. For example, it's all right in Florida to own a pet skunk or a pet raccoon, but here you're not allowed to do that. And if one of these gets surrendered to the animal shelter, then it has to be euthanized because it is a rabies vector. And those laws are different from state to state, and so that's an important thing for you to know about, especially for wildlife species, but also for things like ferrets, which are not allowed to be kept as pets in California, or at least weren't when I lived near California. Quick note about wildlife. This is me holding a screech owl um, when I was on rotation with the wildlife section in Florida. So um, wildlife rehabilitation may require a separate license from a veterinary license or from a technician license or from even from a shelter. And so if you don't have a license to work with wildlife or if that's not included in your license, then you really should not be taking care of these animals. Most shelters that see cats and dogs routinely are not set up for wildlife rehabilitation. Of course, there are some shelters where this is a significant part of what they do, and they have great facilities, and those are places where if you work near them, you can transport your wildlife to them. You should have a shelter protocol for wildlife in general because people don't know on the street that you shouldn't take your injured deer fawn to the shelter. They may not understand that. And so all of a sudden, here you are left with this thing, and the person has now left the building, and you have to deal with it. Um, my recommendation is that you assess the patient if they're injured and it's not a protected species, like an endangered species, like an eagle, then euthanasia is recommended if it's allowed for you to do that in your jurisdiction. If they're injured but it's not life-threatening, then the nearest wildlife rehabilitator should be contacted and that number should be in your protocol. And if they're not injured, as much as you can, encourage the surrenderer to put them back where they came from. Think of it as a TNR without the N part. So now that you have managed your adoptions and you've managed your um, at least outcomes, you figured out an outcome pathway for your shelter, 
it is good to mention to whoever might be taking this animal from you that there are diseases that are particular to exotic pets that humans can also get. The first one that is important, and I alluded to this earlier, is rabies. And in some places, rabies vaccines are considered illegal when they're given to these species. And so even if they are vaccinated, the state does not recognize that. Salmonella, so if you have reptiles and birds, reptiles of any kind, um, they often shed these diseases uh, without um, any symptoms whatsoever. Uh, small turtles in particular are known for giving kids salmonella when the kids put them in their mouths. So something to watch for if you have turtles on your adoption floor. Chlamydia cetaceae is psittacosis. That's the disease that you can get from parrots. Um, birds may or may not be symptomatic for this, but you might see symptoms of it. In humans, you can see pneumonia, diarrhea, splenitis, and hepatitis. Ringworm is one of my favorite things to talk about. Guinea pigs and rabbits can certainly get ringworm. A lot of times, if it's an M. canis ringworm, they got it from a cat somewhere. Guinea pigs can pick up trichophyton um, more commonly, but can also get M. canis if they're hanging out with an infected cat, just like us. And rat bite fever is another one that if you're housing rodents, you might want to watch out for. The biggest thing that you're going to notice in people is the enlarged lymph nodes. And there are many more zoonotic diseases. This is just sort of a list of the ones that I run into, people asking me about the most commonly. And it's good to know if you're an adopter that this is possible. So exotic adoptions, how to do this the best way. Um, this is something that I think people get really stressed out about because um, we want to make sure that these animals are set up in the very best places possible. And um, sometimes we end up taking a little bit too much um, responsibility for ensuring that the adoption, adoptive home has every single characteristic that we think it should. So um, have a conversation with the adopter about their experience level with this species. Because for me, for some of these species, the adopter might know a heck of a lot more than I do. The shelter should be a source of education and educational materials. So sending those husbandry and care sheets home with the owners is a really good idea. Um, and then set, that can help set their expectations for what kind of time commitment they're talking about, vet care commitment, what to clean with, all of the things that you are figuring out yourself when you take one of these animals into your shelter. If you can send their primary enclosure home with them, it's great because you have basically endorsed this cage as the right cage for this species. And I wouldn't do it for free either. It can be part of the adoption fee. So that then you can replace that primary enclosure later. And then you do need to probably inform the new owner of public health and legal considerations so, for example, it's not legal to have ferrets in California or roosters in the city limits of Ithaca. And so if I'm adopting a rooster, I just need to let the adopter know and make sure they don't live in this jurisdiction. Oh, yeah. So this is um, a picture of a lorikeet sitting on a um, bowl of sunflower seeds, which is kind of funny because lorikeets don't eat seeds. They eat fruit. One of a reminder that sometimes the Internet pictures are not, you know, up, up to par. So I'm going to go through a case really quick. It will be just a few minutes, and then we can stop and take questions. And this is a case that I had when I was a resident at Oregon Humane. We had an overwhelmed breeder who surrendered a large number of rats to a small shelter in southern Oregon. They were in very bad condition, and almost all of them were euthanized at intake because they were essentially dying. They did have some healthy ones. They adopted two of them out, and they noticed that some were sneezing and some had skin disease, and then they sent 15 of them up to Oregon Humane in Portland. Two of them were cleared and adopted before the rest of them were actually examined, and so now we have 13 left. And this is when I'm roped in because uh, one of my technicians asked me to look at these rats because they were constantly scratching their ears and they had bite marks on their ear margins. So can you see that in the pictures of their ears and then on the side of their nose too, they have these lesions. So I did 13 physical exams on these rats and I did 13, three skin scrapings. I picked the worst one. And this is what I saw in the microscope. You guys know what's coming next. 
So this is a mange mite called Nodoedres murus. Cats can get a Nodoedres too, and it's related to Sarcoptes scabii, which is the mange, the mange that we think of when we say, oh, that mangy cur on that dog, super itchy, um, lives very superficial in the skin, and it can probably be transferred to people, although there aren't a lot of particularly Nodoedres murus um, cases in people described in the literature. So what do you do next? Now that you're in this situation, you have all these rats and they have a contagious skin disease. Well, I treated them all um, with selamectin, which is revolution, that applied according to the weight of each rat. And then I remember those two that got adopted. I called them back and I said, oh, hey, whoops, um, you might want to get your rats checked out. We can treat them for you if you want. I also called the other shelter and let them know because they still had seven rats. And they um, treated the rats that were in their care and called the adopters that had adopted rats from them. And then we instituted biosecurity, which in this particular situation involved keeping their cages at least three feet away from other cages, because that's how far these mites can crawl, and making sure everybody wore gloves. So on recheck, 10 days later, they were improved. 17 days later, you couldn't even tell that anything was going on. They got a second dose of revolution and we cleared them for adoption. We did disclose that the rats had had this disease, but it's very unlikely that they would get it again unless they were exposed to somebody else that had them. And I will say, I didn't include it in the story, but one of our technicians also got a lesion on his hand. Um, and it was uh, probably from this mite and it responded very well to therapy from his doctor. So that all turned out well, even though it probably could have been handled better. And that seems like the way that it goes a lot of times handling exotic animals in the shelter. There's a lot of improvisation. There's a lot of looking things up. There's a lot of figuring it out as you go, but as veterinarians and veterinary technicians and shelter medicine people, I think we're all used to that and that sort of flexibility and um, uh, really care for animals and trying to do things the right way, even if we aren't really sure what that is at the very beginning. I think we're all pretty well equipped to do that. So these are the resources that are also in the little resource tab below. Um, I think they're very great. Um, I. Uh, love these textbooks. The textbooks are actually available for $20 with the online version. There are hundreds of dollars if you get the um, printout version. I get the printout version from the library when I need it, and I have the $20 version on my computer. Thank you very much. Oh, this slide is here, sorry, to um, remind me to mention that exotic pets in the shelter sometimes are food for other exotic pets in the shelter. And that can be really confusing to everybody. And it's good to have some sort of discussion with staff members and a policy towards feeding live food to other exotic pets and whether that's something that your shelter is comfortable with or not. So that's my last statement and I'm happy to take questions and comments now. Thank you, Dr. Tatar. that was amazing. So I'm gonna push some questions out to you. And here is your Great. first one. This is, what suggestions do you have about the welfare of chickens in the shelter environment? Ah, this is a good question. Um, I am a city girl and I have not personally ever cared for chickens, but I have friends that do and have them. Um, what I recommend is if you see them very often, having a setup for them, and that may involve having a hen house at the back of the shelter that's secured from predators, both above and below, um, and can be um, maybe partitioned if you have chickens coming in from multiple different sources. I don't recommend keeping chickens in the stainless steel um, cages in your shelter, especially next to cats. Um, and it can be difficult in some jurisdictions, like I mentioned, that don't allow rooster adoptions. So having a plan for where those should be placed in advance is really nice. Um, is the internet and advertising for chickens on the internet is something that has been successful for our shelter, trying to get them adopted. Um, uh, in terms of chicken medicine, I refer all my cases to my um, 
chicken friends, some of whom also work at the shelter, so that's very convenient for me. But it's nice to have a large animal or poultry vet that you can call and ask questions for if you have medical concerns for these guys. All right, thank you for that. Here is your next question. Can you use accelerated hydrogen peroxide around birds? Excellent question. So the answer is yes. However, um, we don't know 100% what the reaction of birds is to very concentrated accelerated hydrogen peroxide. And so my recommendation would be to keep the disinfection um, concentrations that you're using to 1 to 32 or below. I would not go up to 1 to 16 or 1 to 8 for the rescue or whatever, um, Excel TB or whatever it is that you're using around birds. Um, of the nice thing about the um, rescue, I'm old enough that I still keep wanting to call it Excel, is that um, you can manipulate your concentration and your time to get the disinfection level that you need. And so if you're interested in killing something like parvovirus, uh, you need 1 to 32 for 10 minutes. If I wanted to have a 1 to 64 instead, I would just have to keep everything wet for 20 minutes instead. And so it's a linear calculation that you can make. So um, yes, and I think it's a great cleanser to use. And I would you don't have to rinse it afterwards because it decays into water but I would be careful about aerosolizing high concentrations of it around the birds. Thank you for that. Next question up, and we're gonna just do a few more, uh, being respectful of time for, for everyone. Mm -hmm. Where can we find resources on how to treat the animals with these diseases, like ringworm? <laughs> Excellent, so for the mammals, the Quesenberry and Carpenter book is the Bible for treating um, all sorts of different types of diseases. So that's the red book on the slide two previous. Um, and it's in the list of resources as well. Um, but the lefebervet.com also has a lot of resources for treating animals, small mammals in particular, that have contagious diseases or dermatological diseases. Great, thank you. Do you recommend spay and neuter for rats or guinea pigs? So that's a, it's a really interesting question. Um, I, I think if you are insisting that a particular set of rats and guinea pigs live together in a way that prevents them from reproducing, it can be very nice to have them spayed or neutered. Um, also with rats, uh, male rats in, in particular, they can have um, testicular cancer that they will get and guinea pigs can have cystic ovaries that they can get. So when they have cancer and when they have cystic ovaries, then I definitely recommend spaying or neutering them if you would like to keep them going or some other way addressing their welfare concerns. Some owners can't afford that and sadly euthanasia is what needs to end up for those animals. Um, as a routine thing, because of the complication rate for spay and neuter in these species and the in unfamiliarity of most um, spay and neuter teams with anesthesia for these species, it's not something I recommend for all shelters. But if you have a crack team and you're used to doing surgery on these animals and you have safe protocols, I don't think that there's anything wrong with it. Great, thank you. What is the best practice with regards to microchipping identification of these one-off unique species? That's a great question and I'm not really sure we have an answer. Um, I, for birds, if they're undergoing any sort of anesthetic procedure, I like to put microchips in them. I like the super tiny ones, and it's uh, the keel area that gets microchipped routinely by protocol in the, rat, in the birds. Um, I wouldn't anesthetize a bird just to put a microchip in it. Um, and if you try to microchip a hyacinth macaw, you're more likely to get your finger broken than you are to actually get a chip in them, depending on the bird. Um, if you have a very valuable species, some of these you know, sugar gliders and kinkajous and things like that can be worth an awful lot of money. And so if you can do so humanely with the humane restraint, it's not a bad idea to microchip them just for security purposes. Um, I think it really depends on the species. It depends on how easy it is to tell one from the other. If you have a leg band in a bird that's unique, you probably don't need a microchip. Um, but it's, a, it's an interesting question. It's not one that our industry has actually answered. And it probably is a good idea to have a discussion if you're thinking about doing it to something exotic, 
to t talk about it with your shelter and figure out if this is something that you want to do or something that you don't. Great. Thank you, Dr. Dittard. That was fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it was really Thank wonderful. you very much. And we thank all of our viewers for watching. For those of you watching on demand, vets and certified vet techs can take a short quiz to qualify for the Certificate of Attendance for Continuing Education Credit. And for those of you who'd like to continue today's discussion or have more questions for Dr. Dittard, please visit the Maddie's Pet Forum webcast group. Thanks for watching and for all you are doing to help the animals.